Good evening. I, I don't think we can do tonight without mentioning Marie Colvin. Uh, Marie uh, was a founding member of this club, and a good friend, and, and a great supporter, somebody who really helped us build this club, and I think we, we should mention that. But, but there's more. Um, she was due to uh, chair this event tonight, um, and so unfortunately, obviously, she's not able to, and I'm obviously grateful for Rasha for standing in her place. Um, she sent us a message that I think you'd like to know the contents of. Um, she said, they're killing people with impunity. I must stay here and write what I can, which is typical Marie. And so I just wanted to share that with you, but also um, it's not just frontline clubs loss. It's not just all those people who knew her loss. And clearly I think from, we can see from the, from the accolade she has received within the press, her peers thought very highly of her if indeed she had many peers. Um, but I think we all, all of us who are prepared to hear some of the more difficult things about the reality of the world we live in, have lost somebody prepared to take the risks to tell us that information. Um, and so, uh, thank you very much. Well, I would like to uh, welcome everybody. My name is Rosha Kenzio, and I'm a presenter in the I'm not hear you. Arabic service. Can you hear me now? No. Is this better? Yeah. No? Yes? Okay. My name is Rosha Kenzio, and I'm a BBC Arabic presenter. I worked for the BBC for a number of years, let's just say. Uh, uh, before welcoming my guest and welcome you, uh, just for house, uh, some, some housework, I can't really start without expressing my honor that I am chairing this tonight instead of uh, Marie. We've never met, but I've read some of her work and I know that she's been friend of friend. Um, I don't want this to turn emotional, although sometimes we cannot avoid that. But before welcoming my guests, uh, let's just say that the, fir the, the first 45 minutes um, are going to be a discussion between my guests and myself, and I'm not going to ban any questions uh, as long as they are relevant and uh, they are relevant to the point that we're talking about. But the rest of the discussion is going to be all yours, so I'm just going to be moderating it for any questions that you would like to ask to my guests. Uh, we're talking obviously about Syria tonight. We're not only talking about Syria after what happened in Homs, but we're talking about the whole thing since it started since March. 2011 and um, before talking about Marie in some really touching lines I would like to uh, welcome my guests Dr. Mona uh, Ghanim she's a Syrian politician vice president of the Syrian political movement building the Syrian state she's also a senior uh, gender advisor with the extent of experience in the Arab region welcome to the event Mr. Ammar Wakaf, who is a member of the Syrian Social Club, which is a group of British Syrians and Syrians um, living in the UK. And uh, Ms. Ramita Navai, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, she's a British Iranian journalist. She is a reporter also for Channel 4's Foreign Affairs series, uh, Unreported World. She's been working uh, highly around the region. And Mr. Malik al -Abdi. It right as well, yeah. who's the chief editor of the Barada TV, uh, London based tier and opposition um, satellite channel, as some of you might know. Now, before I start and before we go into our, the body of our discussion, uh, one of the most touching things that I've read today about Marie is actually the, the very realistic thing written by Jim Muir, who's, as you, some of you also might know, a BBC reporter. He said that. Um, Friends urged her not to go, but for her, that wasn't an option. So I think it's not an option for us to skip this discussion tonight because it's about people, it's, about, it's not about any regime, it's about democracy, it's about what's happening on the ground, and it's about people here talking about people there. So let's bear in mind that, yes, we're talking politics, yes, we're talking what's going on on the ground, but we're also talking about the right of humans to live properly if I may say. 
Now, the first question is going to be for um, Dr. Mona. Dr. Mona, what's, what exactly is happening from your point of view and from your experience? And you've been, uh, you've been here for a few days. I've been here for yeah. a few days. What is happening where? In homes or on the political domain? No, and on the ground in homes. On the ground. I think uh, uh, there has been a, a huge attempt from the beginning to create a civil war or a civil conflict among the people of Homs. And because this, the regime has used uh, an aggressive violence from the beginning, this has produced a counter violence as well. And now it's hard, to, to, it's hard for me to get the right information uh, what is happening, but uh, I think there has been a, an increasing use for, uh, for violence during the last three weeks, which has uh, caused uh, a great deal of casualties uh, uh, among uh, people there. We know that the humanitarian uh, circumstances is very bad. bad. The, the city has been cut off from the outside world. Uh, the, situation, the situation is deteriorating very badly in homes. Mr. Amor might have a different view about this. What I know till now is 7,000 people have been killed since last March. <coughs> 90 people have been killed only yesterday in Homs. So how would you describe what's going on in Homs on the ground? And of course in Syria, if you're free to express the, the rest of it on the ground in Syria. Well, the point that I disagree with, uh, with Dr. Muna here is that uh, I believe that uh, violence from the other part, from the uh, opposition part, started very early on. Uh, we've seen an attack on, uh, on the army in Banyas, we've seen the Jusr al-Shughur massacre, we've seen uh, massacres in Nawa, in uh, Saida, in Dar'a. Sorry, sorry, when you say massacres, who's, who's killing whom? Uh, apparently rebels killing army uh, members, officers, even army families in the case of Saida. Uh, and, and that uh, told us, as, as Syrians basically, that the, the armed uh, faction or armed uh, face of the insurgency was there from day one, really. Uh, this deteriorated in certain places uh, to the point that there is not much law and order, especially in the city of Homs, for example. And the state would have the duty, after all, if the state is still intact, to... No, not kill children, but, uh, but to restore law and order in, uh, in certain places. There will always be collateral damage when you're dealing with people who are fighting right. from civilian areas, unfortunately. When you say restore order, how exactly uh, does any regime restore order in a place taken by rebels? Well, you have to understand as well that uh, when those people control a certain area, that doesn't mean that the entire population of the area are welcoming of these rebels. The, the chances are, actually, is that the civilians in those areas are being taken hostage rather than being supportive totally of those. Uh, obviously, they will have some environment uh, of people who will support them, but the majority, perhaps, of the people uh, would fear opening their shops, would fear getting out even in the street unless they adhere to what the militants say. And that's very usual when the state control is out of uh, there. So those people can basically uh, have the right that uh, the state that they believe in would come and intervene and, uh, you know, uh, deliver them from this uh, trouble and, uh, and uh, uneasiness that they're living mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, Ramit, you've been one of the, not one of, the first person to actually report from Syria and you're working under this guy as much as I understand. Uh, what exactly did you see when you first go, went to Syria? Well, first of all, I have to respond to what you just said, um, based on what I saw yeah. as well. I think it's widely accepted that from day one, it was peaceful. The protests were peaceful. They were not armed from day <coughs> one. Protesters, activists, have started to arm themselves. Yes, they have. And it started as a defensive measure. And also, when we're talking about rebels, who are the rebels? Who, who, I think it's, it's an important question. Who is the Free Syrian Army? These rebels, Free Syrian Army, most of them are ordinary Syrians, like me and you. And they've, they've taken to arming themselves to protect themselves and their families. Right? It's, a, it's a natural step. So we're, we're really not talking about different groups Have of militia. Have you anybody of the civilians being targeted? by the Free Syrian Army if they're not agreeing with what they say. Right. In, in all the places I was in, um, and we went to quite a few places outside of Damascus. Such as? Uh, 
went to a town called Medaya, which is near Zabadani, um, on near the Lebanese border. We went to uh, Douma, um, Harasta, uh, about five towns. My question is just mm -hmm. to show that there are places that you visited which were um, hot zones, if we may call them. Yeah. They were an old con. Yeah. Um, so nobody was taken hostage. Uh, nobody was kidnapped. Um, the activists, and these are the men we're talking about, they were not terrorists. They are not terrorists. Mm -hmm. At that point, they weren't armed. But I tell you what, they were saying, we need to arm ourselves. They, they, they could, some of them, uh, especially when the town I was in was besieged, you couldn't walk down the road to get bread. Mm -hmm. There were government snipers everywhere. Before we get into the body of this discussion, which is what the international community can actually do to help the situation or to save the situation, or whatever you want to call it, let's see how the opposition, the political opposition, is seeing the whole thing. Uh, Mr. Malik, some of the criticism being held against the political mm. op opposition, if we may call so, is that they are not unified, they don't have a program, so basically they are not presenting an alternative if Bashar Assad is tomorrow not on top. Okay, well, I mean, talking about the opposition, you can talk all night about, about the opposition and trying to dissect who they are and why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, in, on Barada TV, we've come, da, we've come under a lot of criticism by the opposition itself for speaking plainly about uh, the shortcomings of the opposition. Um, so I'm coming under two fires, if, if you like, one from the regime and one from the opposition itself. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, this is the challenges of, of uh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, free media in Syria, I suppose. The main problem, as I see it, is that the op opposition is made up of intellectuals. Mm -hmm. That's the main problem because they uh, suffer from the same problem of the same disconnection with the people as much as the regime itself. I am, perhaps, uh, naturally don't trust the intelligentsia or people who, have, who, have, who, who, who claim to be the, the elite of society. Mm. And the problem with the Syrian opposition is that it is an elite of sorts, but it's an elite, it's a mirror image of the elite that developed under the, under the Syrian regime, under the Assad regime. There's a new elite which is being groomed for the last 11 months. Part of this elite is within the Syrian National Council, which is the body that I would, I would argue that the, the largest opposition body uh, so far. But also part of the elite is also part of other smaller opposition coalitions. Yeah. But if you look at their political programs, you realize actually they, they don't, they, there isn't much connection with the ordinary person. There is definitely a class, a huge class difference, and also a huge, let's say, intellectual difference. Um, and for that reason, that's why the opposition hasn't been able to be in a commanding position. They haven't led the revolutionary movement, mm -hmm. and I don't think they will ever uh, end up le leading the revolutionary movement. Does this apply on the Free Syrian Army as well? No, the Free Syrian Army is a completely different kettle of fish. Right. Completely different. The Free Syrian Army is very much a grassroots uh, movement, very much like the Tansiqiyat, these local committees that record protests or record human rights abuses and upload them to YouTube. Mm -hmm. They're very much a grassroots uh, movement. And in fact, there is a great deal of uh, distrust between uh, the, the, the political opposition on the one hand and the Free Syrian Army on the other, because the Free Syrian Army's agenda is to bring topple the Assad regime through military means. And the, and the politicians want to topple or dismantle the Assad dictatorship through negotiations. Mm -hmm. So they're mutually incompatible programs as far as I see it and while the, the politicians sometimes pay lip service to the Free Syrian Army because they have they enjoy so much popularity on the street I think ultimately they're mutually incompatible programs and the political opposition the only way that it could seize power or you could ever uh, be in government is to negotiate with the regime that's I think it's that's an obvious so while they while they claim to be working to topple Bashar al-Assad in reality they're just position, positioning themselves to uh, on the negotiating table, let's say, yeah. and the different opposition groups, they're all vying to be on the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And the person who's going to decide who's going to sit on the, on the negotiating table yeah. are countries like Qatar, like Saudi Arabia, like the Arab League. That takes me to the international part of it, into the regional part of it, and then the international part of it. Mr. Waqaf, the thing is, 
let's be frank here about it. The opposition and the international community now to seem to agree that Bashar al-Assad must go. End of story. Point yeah. full stop. Does the regime actually realize that there is no uh, steps of reform, there is no speeches that are going to be made, made done by the highest profile people in the state going to change this after what's happening on the ground? Well, I think we're pretty much preoccupying ourselves with the regime itself. I think we should be talking about what the majority of Syrians, perhaps, would wish to have. Uh, I claim to be speaking in the name of many Syrians here tonight uh, who do not the, want right. many. many or the majority? Well, I would say the majority, actually. Okay. I would say the majority of Syrians do not want the central government to collapse especially if we're talking that suddenly we're going to have a, a government that is appointed by Saudi Arabia or government that is appointed by Qatar or Turkey and so on. The reasons why those people do not want the central government to collapse is not because all of them like Bashar al-Assad or like the regime. Actually, some of them even hate the policies and hate the person himself. But all of these people agree that it would be far costly to lose the central government than to actually uh, uh, entrust it with certain reforms that could, you know, day after day improve. Uh, what they would want from the international community is basically two points, two main points. A, to intervene in a way to stop the killing as soon as possible, and intervene in a way that would guarantee the prosperity and welfare of the Syrian people on the long term. The problem is that the international community is intervening for a completely different objective, which is to topple President Assad. And a lot of Syrians, and I would say again, the majority of Syrians, believe that if the international community sticks to this third objective mainly, then it would reflect badly on the two main objectives, because the killing is not going to start if they only target President Assad stepping down. And the welfare of the Syrian people is not guaranteed at all, because you will have something like uh, the Libya scenario or the Iraq scenario. You may even end up in a civil war that hasn't really started down sectarian lines in a sense. And the reason why a civil war hasn't really started down sectarian lines is that at least the minorities, and I think everybody still in the country, s perceive the government to be st strong and intact. And that's why they don't feel the need yet to take matters into their own hands. First of all, I'd like to comment a little bit on, uh, on the description for the, for the opposition, if, if you give me some time. Uh, I, I don't agree with what, he, what uh, our colleague has said about the Free Syrian Army. I used to think that the, Syri the Free Syrian Army is, doesn't want to overthrow the, the regime by power uh, or by military. I, I used this established just to, to keep the, the safety of the demonstration. Uh, this is what I. Uh, this is what I, I've never heard them saying that they want to use mili uh, fights or they use. They wanted to to protect the civilians. So this is this is one issue. The other issue. Uh, I'm coming from political movement from inside Syria, and we believe that the, at the end of the story, everybody should come to the table, to round table for for negotiation. But I didn't. I, I don't think the other opposition would like to come to to negotiation. Uh, I, d I don't think that what happened. Why happen do you think so? Why do you think they, they don't want to come they, to the negotiation? Many of them, especially some <laughs> some organization or some opposition organization outside the Saturday, they say no negotiation, no dialogue. Our program starts from the moment that Bashar leaves the country. And, and what is happening? Ju just one second. What is happening now in in Tunisia today doesn't tell that Saudi Arabia wants to have negotiation. If it's I would the first one to go for this because I believe in negotiation to end civil wars and. This is the history has tell, told us that the end, uh, at the end you have to come at the round table uh, to, 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 to finalize the issue. I think now what is happening in, uh, what happened with the Syrian opposition that because of the time pressure, we didn't have any political life. Most of the people who, who, di who hate the system was, were outside the country. There was a time pressure to create some opposition and they, some people wanted to impose the Libyan scenario, I mean, uh, not realizing that every country, every people is different from the other. So basically you do not believe in the international inter interference in a military way? I don't think it will help. It will contribute to the division of the society because the, this regime still have some supporter and for us as a Syrian, once there is a military intervention, we will forget about the regime. We will be unified against the the, the military intervention. At the beginning, f in March, when the Syrian people went into demonstration, despite the violence exercised by them, on, by the regime, their call was freedom and dignity. 
their freedom and dignity. And I think today what is happening that everybody has forgot about the, the, the aspiration of the Syrian people and now countries, forces, opposition are fighting among each other on what they want, not what was the Syrian needs. Mentioning the aspiration of the Syrian people, I'm going to go back to Malik. Malik, do you mm. think the Syrian people can afford to actually sit down on a table and open a new page, open a dialogue with the president along with the killing? Because mm. what I've heard over the last few months uh, and what I see on my TV every day is that some uh, Syrian opposition groups, and I'm going to say some just to be mm. precise because I'm being criticized by Mr. Omar, uh, is that they, they, they can never sit down on a table, shake hands with the person who actually killed their family. So can they afford it? Well, the simple, I mean, the simple answer is why should they? I mean, why should I sit down with Bashar al-Assad? If you no longer regard him as the legitimate president, and he was, in my opinion he was never the legitimate president because he was never elected democratically, then uh, I, don't th I don't think those people should be forced to sit down with, with someone, with a, with a tyrant and a killer like Bashar al-Assad. I think we've gone way past the point of negotiations. I think if he was genuinely interested in negotiations, he could have started a genuine uh, process many months ago. I think we've, you know, that ship has sailed. Um, but there are people, there are politicians, there are intellectuals inside Syria who know very well if there's an election tomorrow, chances are they're not going to get win any seats. Mm. The only way they're going to get to power or enjoy at least a share of power or a few cabinet posts, perhaps, is to sit down and negotiate with Bashar, turn down the military option and say, look, that's not convenient for us. S negotiate with Bashar and hopefully get a few cabinet posts in any you know, reform, uh, reform government. And I think a, a lot of people inside Syria, a lot of, not people, but a lot of politicians in particular, and we have to, and again, I urge to make a huge differentiation between career politicians and you know, these opposition activists on the one hand and the ordinary people on the other because there's a huge disconnect between the two mm -hmm. and I would actually I would um, I would you know I, I totally disagree with the idea that people don't want foreign intervention in fact actual fact the people of Dara in the south if, for instance and this is just to, you know for argument's sake if the Jordanian army was to enter Syria for instance which is, it seems very unlikely at the moment but if that was to happen in order to save those people from uh, the Syrian army then that would they, those people would welcome that. If people in Idlib in the north saw the Turks coming, they would very much welcome that. Um, in my opinion, the majority of people in Syria would welcome some sort of intervention, not necessarily direct military intervention, but perhaps arming of the Free Syrian Army so they can at least defend themselves. The Saudis made that suggestion today in Tunis before they stormed out. Um, and I, I agree with what the Saudi foreign minister said, which is that all this meeting and all this talk is simply a waste of time because ultimately Bashar al-Assad is there isn't enough pressure on Bashar al-Assad to force him out mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's the bottom line and uh, anything short of military force he's staying where he is because he's still got the army he's still got the backing of, 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 of Russia and China and talk and promises and it's not going to do the trick uh, before moving to Russia and China and the rest of the international community outside the Arab League I would like to talk to Ramita about the issue of the borders I was uh, speaking to Mr. Amar a few days ago and uh, he kindly uh, stated that there is a problem uh, when it comes to the borders in Syria because one of the main complaints of the regime is who actually comes across those borders and who gets into the country uh, and doesn't belong to the Syrian revolution, we may call it, yeah, yeah. if we want to call it that, or... Uh, yeah, so foreign fighters and... Uh, yeah. So uh, the borders, from what, from what you saw, how uh, credible is this? Um, I think this is an interesting point. Um, and really, time is of the essence here, not just because every week that goes by, there's more bloodshed. But I think because there is an emerging power vacuum. Um, and what hasn't happened yet that uh, America is very worried about, that speaks openly about, that Assad has been saying since day one. What hasn't happened, um, uh, jihadist uh, groups coming in, um, uh, uh, Hezbollah arms. Um, well, let's be frank, we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, 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 an axe, which is uh, Iran, uh, Israel, and Russia from behind. So basically, there is, there is a threat of a war in the region 
if things kept the yeah. way they are. So this is why time is important. Because of this emerging power vacuum, the, the longer we leave it, the more likely it is that all these things will happen. Mm. That's why we must act now. Yeah, of course, the border is very porous. Uh, there have been reports of um, uh, Hezbollah fighters coming in. These are not confirmed. Um, but sorry, what I meant before is that um, foreign jihadi groups, Al-Qaeda, there have been no confirmed reports of them joining the activists yet. However, who knows you know, if that won't happen or if that will happen. I also would like to respond uh, to what my colleague said um, about the majority of Syrians backing Assad. I think that's highly debatable. And I think, uh, certainly from what I saw on the ground, he had very little support. And, ex and what Malik um, al-Abdo was saying, that there is no turning back. The regime has lost all its legitimacy. It's clinging on by brute force alone. And I also think it's important to remember um, Saddam Hussein uh, lived 10 years in absolute isolation. And he was a pretty friendless dictator, as Gaddafi was. Assad is not a friendless dictator. You mentioned his allies. He, th there's also Iran. There's also Hezbollah Lebanon. So I, I think it's vital to act. And I also agree with Malik that one of the only ways of doing this is um, arming the uh, activists arming the Free Syrian Army and letting Syrians decide their future for themselves. Dr. Amuna, there are two ways of talking about international support uh, or regional support. There is the political way, which is lobbying, and there is the military way, which is arming, basically. So what do you think is more suitable for the Syrian opposition if they really believe that Russia is backing Bashar with arms, not only the veto in the, in the I UN. I think it's, it's a way of simplifying the cases in Syria when you talk about only the president. I don't think the president is the problem. I don't <coughs> think if the president now decided to back up and to leave the country, this issue will be, will be solved. We should understand the complicity of the situation in Syria. It's not the president. He is supported by the army, by the security, by the businessman. He has some support. What is the percentage? I don't know. I mean, nobody knows. What is the percentage of the uh, people who believe in negotiation? We don't know. But we should understand that some Syrian, some Syrian is still packing up the regime. And those Syrians have the right with the future of Syria. We could, we, the process of democratic transition should be inclusive. It should not be exclusive. And if we use to, to call for military intervention or arming the, the opposition, this, this, is, this is unfair for the Syrians. We are arming the opposition to kill themselves through a, 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 a long-term civil, civil war. And this, because the army and the security will continue to back up the regime, regardless if the president is there or not. Yeah, but some of the opposers that I've spoken to have been talking about the other party, which is the regime, is already being armed, is already being helped. Well, so I'm, not, I'm not justifying, I'm not justifying yeah. for the regime using the violence. I'm against this. I am in the opposition because I'm against the regime in, and I want the regime to walk out. Uh, to walk out. I want this regime to, to be changed. I want this regime to be a democratic regime. I'm not in for the favor of the regime. Yeah, on the how? contrary, That's the question. how? Yeah. How? We think that it's only through international consensus because this regime is backed up by France. As you mentioned, he has friends. And these friends are very important countries in the, in the international domain. I think by creating an international consensus among this among the, these countries with the other countries, with the friends of Syria, I think this is the only way for a sa the safest exit strategy. I mean, yes, at the end, Saddam has went, but how many people were dead for this cause? At the end, Gaddafi left, but how many people were injured? What is about the infrastructure where the Syrian has spent their lives building that Syrian hospital, Syrian yeah, roads? But the counter argument will also ask you, what about the 7,000 people allegedly being killed till the, now. the people who killed them should be should mm -hmm. be should be punished. They should there should be some some measure legal measures to do that. I'm not justifying this. This is this is kills. This is very painful for every Syrian. But so I don't do want to stop the killing. What ha, we can stop the killing by creating international consensus among Russia and uh, and China and EU and this is difficult right. I know it's let's very display, difficult let's display the, the the scene for that if we want to actually play on a monopoly you know background the thing is in the United States there is a presidential elections this year in Russia there is a presidential elections so these two the 
I don't think the international community has showed any interest in coming into Syria and save <coughs> the causes till now. Till now, we'll see. Right. But anyway, um, the thing is, if you want to sit down on a table and discuss something, Mr. Ammar, will this be satisfying for the regime? That's the question. Well, I think the international community realizes very well that the regime isn't going anywhere. And that's why they have been reluctant. Now, let's go back to the two points. Reducing the number of the dead, or let's just say reducing it the cost. It reduced, I'm afraid. No, the, well, in a sense, you're talking about the number of the dead. The future ones. Yeah, the yeah. future yeah. ones. Because if we arm, for example, the opposition, instead of 7,000, we would be talking about 70,000. Mm -hmm. If NATO comes in, we would be talking perhaps even at you know, 700,000. And if everybody wants to laugh that number, all they need to do is to look across the border to Iraq, because that's exactly what happened. And Syrians realize this very much. Now, uh, the way to do it is that the international community needs to be proactive with regards to the issue in Syria. They need to tell the regime that the opposition is not going anywhere, but they also need to tell the opposition that the regime is not going anywhere. And they need to put pressure on both sides to come to a table. The opposition in Syria needs incubation, both from the state and both from the international community to give it confidence. And for the people on the ground to start believing in the opposition, because the people on the ground now, mind you, do not believe that the opposition leads them. They, ha they are on the streets for their own subjective reasons. There are reasons of religious nature, there are reasons uh, of uh, fear nature, they fear the appraisal of the regime, uh, they have, you know, the blood passion and they are under huge propaganda from the likes of Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and so on. And so they are in the streets. The, the, especially the external opposition is really running behind the street, as Malik has said in numerous cases as well. They are running behind the street in order to assume its leadership. But then there isn't any connection. And the analogy that was put by the but Syrian... I can see a contradiction in here, because now I don't understand who's following who. Yeah. The thing is, it started on the street. Yes. And then the opposition started forming itself to a body that can speak on behalf of the people, right? The opposition figures have been there for a while. You know, Mr. Al-Abdi and the, the, the Muslim Brotherhoods, for example. Yeah, the, the, the traditional the coordination. opposition. But they have not, been not there all the time. Just, yeah, well, know. that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. The point is that th the street is there on their subjective reasons. And uh, the closer the opposition gets to them, the more leadership they, the street can give the opposition uh, for their fate. But this is not happening yet. Mm -hmm. So what really needs to happen is for the, the, the opposition figures or the opposition itself to be um, incubated, mm -hmm. both by the state within a new political system <coughs> and both by the international community to give it certain confidence and to give it certain representation and to give the street, uh, the people that, on the street the some hope. The regime is not going anywhere and so does the opposition. So they need to sit down and talk. Everybody knows that going back to pre-March 15th status is, is not viable. It's not going to happen, right. basically. Can I just... Uh, talk about, because she went twice on me, and, and I need to respond one. Now she, th the lady went to Madaya, for example, and Madaya, everybody knows, if, if you're a Syrian, you would know, that every 13-year-old has a gun. Everybody in Madaya ha have guns, because they're all smuggling, and they're all clashing with the customs Hang department on a, minute. Okay, so, on a daily so, basis. So. People, have, people have rifles because they're farmers, and yeah. they go hunting. No, no, no. Yes. It's, they're smuggling. They're, they're clashing with the government right, on a so daily basis. So the point basis. is, Mr. Omar, the point and, is about and, Madaya again. Uh, yeah, the about Madaya. You know, when, when a journalist goes in, especially if they it are... It wasn't just Madaya I went to. Yeah, well, uh, when yeah, a journalist... The point, about, is, yeah, the point is, the point is, is, when a journalist, and this is a journalism uh, club, when a journalist goes in and he's escorted, for example, by the people of the opposition, they're obviously not going to, zo to show them everything. They're obviously going, to, you know, probably she wouldn't have had the, the courage or she would probably advise uh, counterwise we're safely talking, not to we're go. We're talking heavy <laughs> bombardment. We're talking heavy uh, shelling of cities. We're not talking about armies. But anyway, we're going mm. to discuss it uh, in a second. Yeah. Sorry, so I, I must interject as well. Yeah, um, I would like to tell you that, as I said, what, 15 minutes ago, the activists I was with were very open about wanting to get weapons. Very open, really? because they were being killed in large number. Right. Desperate to get their hands on guns. This is not something they were hiding from me. That's what they, they told need, you, they but need that's probably not what they wanted. You know, so. Right. Malik, back mm. to the opposition um, for it and back to uh, the media September. talking about the opposition for it. Do you think that the Western media have, have, have dealt um, fairly with the Syrian regime, frankly? Dealt fairly? Uh, because this is one of the accusations. Come on, let's face it. People talking about media are actually 
being biased when it okay. comes to the Syrian thing? I would, I would argue, and after following, seeing a number of uh, Arab revolutions, Tunisia, then Egypt, then Libya, I would say that at least let's focus about the Arab media first, that you're very sort of familiar with. I would say they've treated the Syrian regime, let's say, in a fairer way than they did Egypt or Tunisia. But why is that? Why is it fairer? Well, first of all, you have to realize the, regi the Syrian regime media-wise is much, much more sophisticated than, than Egypt or Tunisia or Libya. Okay. That's number one. Secondly, the, re the Syrian regime does have a lobby, a more effective lobby, even within organizations like Al Jazeera and even the BBC Arabic itself. So there are people, for example, Lebanese who are pro-Hezbollah, so therefore they try to promote pro-regime stories, for instance. And that nece didn't necessarily happen with Libya or Egypt or any of these other countries. Mm. I've seen a pattern emerging in the Arab media where you have an opposition spokesman, he gets interviewed, and then you get a, not a Syrian government spokesman, but simply a dentist or someone who claims to be, you know, well, in many ways, similar to Ammar, who is, he's not a government spokesman, but he's sympathetic to the regime. So you get these guys who are non-people, you the know, regime. <coughs> simple people sympathetic. are sympathetic to the regime all the time. So this is an emerging pattern. You get an opposition guy and get a pro-regime guy. And that never used to happen in any of the other revolutions. And you used to you work in the media, and you know this. So I would say that um, <coughs> actually the Syrian regime has got more uh, time to defend itself more than any other any other regime. And well, why not say he's got far more supporters on the ground? Say, of course, you differ with that. No, no, it's a media yeah, strategy. It's a media strategy. Uh, he also has a far more powerful military than Gaddafi ever had. He's got what three hundred thousand. He's got hundreds and thousands. Um, of troops. He can afford to lose a whole lot. And in fact, respected analysts have been saying that he can also afford to lose control of certain areas of the country. And as long as he can afford to pay his army, se the security forces, Assad isn't going anywhere. <coughs> right. Uh, Ammar, do you think the international media, the Western media and the international media, including ourselves, mm. uh, we're a pan Arab channel and we work uh, supposedly like the rest of the BBC in Portugal? Do you think that? to the fairness of the game, media has helped or not helped to um, report what's going on on the ground? Well, there are two sides of the story. There are the media who are trying to report, but perhaps not being you know, helped very much by the, uh, well, the reluctance of the Syrian government, which I actually criticize, of letting free journalists in. And, uh, and B, you have the media who are not reporting, but actually inciting events in Syria. Now let's just speak in numbers. A, a, a recent opinion poll said that 55% of Syrians do not want President Assad to go. Now let's just that's, ask ourselves. That's published where? That's published as part of the <coughs> Doha debates, <coughs> and this was funded sorry. by the Qatari Foundation. Did they send people to Homs and Idlib? Well, I'm and sure Madaya they are respectable. Duma, this is, this is you, Gov Siraj. They're not kids, you see. And, uh, and I'm sure they sent. I'm yeah. sure they sent their envoys. Well, they to did. These they places. did. They did. They well. Actually, this opinion poll is very interesting because it it has the sample is all I over the Arab world, yeah, and it says that eighty percent of the entire sample, eighty percent of the entire sample wanted Assad to go, but actually fifty five percent from those polled inside Syria How didn't want him to How many people voted? Yeah, no, 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 it was uh, one thousand twelve. But it's a representative sample, you see. That's what statistics well, anyway, tell you. Anyway, the thing is, the thing but is, the, no, no, no. Th yeah. This is a very important point. <laughs> And if you have 80% of the people outside Syria wanting President Assad to go and 55% people, uh, percent of Syrians do not want him to go, that tells you two things. A, that he has still a large support. And I've explained to you that not all of them love him, but actually are wary of what to come next. And B, which is most important, that what people perceive to be happening from outside Syria is very different from what people see on the ground in Syria. And this is a key point. That will actually that exclude people like yourself. The problem is people living abroad are accused of being not really aware of what's going on on the ground, which is very untrue. Because the thing is, you've been working with this closely, or else you wouldn't be interviewed here. Yeah. Dr. Amuna, do you think that people living on the ground will think of the media, the international, the Western media, or the international media, <laughs> in a way to work in their favor? Since we actually lack... Uh, just just a general information we've been lacking reporters on the ground we had a report on the ground but he wasn't allowed to go around so many places in Syria even the Arab League couldn't really I mean they had difficulties in some places 
we need it to rely on eyewitnesses and most of the time. So what do you think? Uh, before I talk about this point, I have two points to 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 raise. I'm sorry, but when she said, yeah, 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 but, but when she said that he has that, that the system has a strong uh, military forces, this is why um, we are against military intervention because he can he can keep co uh, uh, fighting forever and then he will turn into a militias where they can control part and then you will enter into civil society. This is why military intervention is not helping the Syrian society. And if military intervention is not helping, arming the the opposition will definitely will not help the Syria because we, they have a very strong army forces and they have many people who will fight with with this regime the second issue for negotiation is not negotiation on the continuing of the regime doing business the same old way or continuing the regime as it used to be it's negotiation and how to transit to transit to transform power into a democratic transition then you have different agendas then you can't sit on the same table because well, the uh, regime they, is not going anywhere they right? they will they there is a point there is a point where the regime will be convinced that they have to to do this negotiation it's not right now but it, it's coming it's not the negotiation with her uh, and preparing this is negotiation will be in the end preparing the country for free election and then we can three of us as Syrians sit on the table and then we can know if majority of Syrian doesn't want Bashar or or some of the Syrian wants Bashar or none of the Syrian wants Bashar it's true free election and transparent election. I can tell you, I mean, everybody see the... the President the Assad has been imposing some, a number of reforms, we need to say, since uh, this no, 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 I don't agree with these reforms. There right. was no reform in Syria from the beginning. There is All no right. reform. I mean, the reform, if the reform should, would have happened, it should have happened during the last 10 years, not now. 11. I mean, I'm not counting the last year because there was some attempt to do reform, which came very late and it's not the right moment. So uh, th there is no reform in Syria. Mm -hmm. There is no reform. Uh, I think maybe he wanted to do some reform at the beginning, but there was no reform. And I'm coming here to speak about a daily experience with working with the government when I, I spent many of my career years working with the in cooperation with the government, there is no reform in Syria. We cannot talk about reform. We talk about transition period where there will be sharing of power to prepare the country for free election. And then we can, we can sit on the table as civilized people to, to speak about democratic transition, not using blood or, or guns or, or weapons to, to, to do this democratic transition. I would imagine that you want to comment on this. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I mean if, you, if, you, if you're trying to argue that somehow Bashar al-Assad is going to start a process where essentially what you're saying is transfer power to you and people like you, I think that's wishful thinking because there's nothing that you possess that can ever force him to make those kind of concessions. Unless, of course, you're relying on the international community, which so far, uh, in my opinion, has failed the Syrian people and also failed you because you're banking on, the, on that international community. I mean, the elephant in the, in, the ho in the whole room, you know, is the whole sectarian issue. And I think this is someone that Syrians have been trying to dodge <laughs> for various reasons, because as Syrians, we don't want to admit that there are different sects in the country and, you know, there are problems. Mm. I mean, historically, <coughs> historically, I don't, I don't believe there was ever a sectarian problem in Syria. Is there a sectarian problem in Syria I think there now, is a, after, yeah, after this Most year? definitely there is, yeah, All absolutely. Right. Um, and... You can trace this sectarian problem back to the early 60s when there was a, a move within the armed forces and within the security services to uh, essentially sack Sunni army officers and replace them with officers from minority backgrounds, particularly Alawites, but also Christians and Druze as well. Mm -hmm. And then 40 years later, you have a situation at the moment where the officer class in the Syrian army and some of the more sort of hard-hitting units in the Syrian army are predominantly Alawite with a sprinkling of other minorities as well. And you ha you've reached a stage where the Syrian state, the, the, the Sunni Arab, like myself, feels that the Syrian state doesn't really represent them. It's not, you know, they feel that a huge, that this, the state which is embodied by Bashar al-Assad okay. and all the state institutions and this great Syrian army that we're supposed to be feel, you know, feel proud of, Actually, there's no relate. Yeah, there is no relations to that to that army, it and that's why people are turning their guns against that right. army, and they're saying the Syrian army is it is a treacherous army. Is the fear of the international community, and, and I'm going to be moving to the questions in one minute. Is the fear of the international community interfering in Syria reflects on the civil war on a sectarian basis, on a sectarian yeah, background? Yeah, I mean, look, Bashar al-Assad 
might as well be a warlord at the moment because that's essentially what he is. Uh, he's a warlord and he's in charge of a big militia and the fear is if the uh, Free Syrian army is ever backed and if Bashar for instance realizes he can no longer hold to Damascus, he can no longer hold on to Damascus for instance he may well withdraw to areas where his own sectarian group, the Alawis, are, have a majority and he can just stay there and fight it out for right. X number of years mm -hmm. similarly like what happened in Lebanon, I think that's, that's the fear but look the whole fear of a sectarian civil war, I think we've gone beyond that stage because the civil war is a reality at the moment. Great sort of turning points in history have come about because of civil wars. Um, I'm not trying to accept, you know... You're <laughs> promoting civil wars? I'm not promoting I, I, civil I wars. It's not essentially a, a, a like promotable brand. Mm. I'm not saying it's a promotable brand. But what, what I'm saying is when you have, you know, great... Uh, do you have any consideration for the number of people who could be killed because of what you're preaching? Well, I mean, look, if you go to Libya, I mean, Libya, there was essentially yeah. a civil war for well, a like number of tens months. Tens of thousands but more. People, have you, did you see the celebrations on the 17th of February? Do you then, see then the, the killing that is happening then today then in care. Libya? No, I don't I would actually. like to comment on this. Oh, you you should, you please, should. Please, uh, if you give me the floor. Uh, first of all, it definitely it wasn't a sectarian issues. It's between pro and against the regime. Definitely. It was, it was fueled by some people, by some people from the regime in homes to, to turn into a sectarian war, yes, but it was never a sectarian. And he, what, whoever would like to lead this militia, he cannot even, go even, to... Even today? Even today. Are you talking I today? Wa I will tell you an experience. I was in, 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 in an Alawite area in the summer, and people who flee out of Homs and out of Hama came to, to shelter with the Alawites on the, on the sea coast. And nobody, not even Bashar, not even anybody, can go and create a, 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 a place for Alawites only because everybody mixed in Syria. There is no isolation. I am an Alawite and I'm coming from Alawite area and we are all mixed in the same areas. We have never thought that this is from this background or from that background. The issue right. is, the issue is that there is some, there is uh, s pro people who are with the, with, the, with the regime and people who are against the regime. Most of the ministers are not Alawites. Most of the businessmen who packed up the regime are from Damascus and, and Aleppo, and they are not Alawites. Well, this is this is this is debatable. I mean, like the people part of the I'll ruling elite, too. surely. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I mean, sorry, I'm for, for, but th they are part of the ruling elite. I mean, Syria is run by what has been described from as both from from Sunni and from Christian right. and from Alawites. Well, not to go the so ruling much elite. No, I think you can bury your head in the sand and say there is no sectarian issue. There is a sectarian issue. the channel of this of this debate. We're talking about the international community and how they're going to interfere or not interfere to solve what's going on now, if their interference is going to be good or bad, and in which way do you think is suitable? Now it's open for questions. The gentleman. Uh, one question to the panel. And can, can you just wait for the microphone and introduce yourself not. first, please? <laughs> um, one, one question for the panel, and that's whether that they think that the British government is doing enough. That clearly doesn't go for the um, apologist gentleman because he probably thinks they're doing too much. But I just think that, um, th are the British government doing enough? And I would like that gentleman who's an apologist for the regime to uh, uh, say, when you say some people have come onto the street because of a blood passion, what is a blood passion? Right. Yeah, well so there are two, two, two no, parts that. of that question. Let's yep. answer the second part first. Well, the second part is that what I meant, probably my English isn't that elaborate but, uh, or eloquent. Yeah. What I meant is that if you have someone who's killed in your family, then you want to stay in the streets to take revenge against the people who you perceive to have killed him or who you know to have killed him. That's what I meant. Yeah, but the that. question is, why are they killed in the first place? That's what so many people would ask. If you have somebody killed in your family, yes, well you're going to have if the, we think the th urge to avenge. The Syrian, what, the Syrian government isn't the Swiss government. You know, w this is a third world country, for God's oh, sake. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's going to have a lot of mistakes and so on and so forth. So, so, so that's what's happening. With regards to the British government, I would like to, because you also mentioned me and the thing. I don't think the British government is doing a lot, actually. I think the British government should be more proactive. And me, as part of the Syrian Social Club, we did ask them to be more proactive rather than lecturing rather than staying on the sidelines, rather than taking the, the issue of sanctions and, and trying to threaten, to be more proactive, to sit down with the Syrian government, to discuss things. <coughs> we believe that would be less costly for the Syrian people. There is a remarkable thing here. The Syrian State TV said the conference being held today in Tunisia 
a meeting of symbols of colonialism. Yeah. Yeah. You agree? Well, not not to uh, not to a large extent. Obviously, Saudi Arabia and Qatar were never colonialists, but they have their own agenda into this. They're fearful of Iran. They want right. to turn the whole thing into a Shiite Sunni uh, struggle, and and we don't like that. Right. Questions. Hi, thanks. Um, I just want to pick up on this distinction that's been made about it being a regime, an anti-regime um, matter, jumping forward in the very unlikely event that there is some kind of peaceful or you know relatively peaceful transfer of power, and that like on firstly that the regime has become increasingly de delegitimized and that Syria as a society is becoming increasingly scarred, I suppose, by the violence that's there. How can you or are there any guarantees that it's not going to be the same kind of retribution or for example, like what we saw in Iraq with debathification and it's going to become, society will become violent or split along those levels. It's obviously led to so much damage in that country. If you may allow me, uh, we'll have the same question for both guests. Dr. Okay. Okay. Well, I think you are, you are right. And this is why in our political movement, we call for negotiation which take into consideration the interest of the all stakeholders in the, in, the, in the Syria society. Because if you don't take into consideration the interest, even for the Ba'ath Party, to be, uh, to be part of the, political, of the future political life, then you will have a lot of problems like happened in Iraq. So our, our perspective, our, our idea that si future Syria should be for everybody. It sh there should be no winner, no loser, and there should be some measures for tra traditional justice where you take <laughs> into consideration. Because you want to, r to build the society. I mean, our, let's remember always that our goal is democratic transition. We want, to get rid, we want to get rid of this regime because it's an obstacle for the democratic transition. It's not a personal revenge because we hate them. Because we, we want to do the best for the Syria. It's not like they have to go now, now. I mean, I don't care what, they, what I'm going to... I can destroy... If you, if you use the absolute power, yes, they can go. If you got, have a chemical weapon, yes. They can go, but so what is that? Stop here, the no, 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 <laughs> but what is... No, what I'm talking that you can, you can let them go, but this is not the object. Right. The object is to have a democratic transition which you, you serve the best interests of the Syria. Mr. Waqaf, can we have um, a reform that's coming gradually under a revolutionary state? This is a very tricky question. Not really. No, not from your side, no. uh, answering it. Because actually, the more, and this is the equation, I'm, I'm trying to be the least emotional here as possible. The more the international community puts pressure on the Syrian regime and government, and the more they feel beleaguered, the less meaningful the reform will be. Mm. That's for sure. Because we've seen, I mean, tomorrow, the and day after tomorrow, there's... Why? Yeah. The day after tomorrow, there's going to be uh, a referendum for the new constitution. Now, I am against so many articles in the new constitution, personally speaking. Uh, and a lot of Syrians are. But all of us would perhaps prefer to vote yes for the new constitution because we want to put the country on a new political trail I can, I and can so on and Mr. so forth. I can read between the lines is that mm. the choice of the mm. worst that we have is better than actually risking something that we don't know. Well, a friend of mine who's a, who's a lawyer here in London, a, a newly acquainted friend of mine, put it in very uh, good sentence. He said, I am a Syrian. I know that my regime is bad. I want something better. I don't want something worse. So. In a sense, we all hope that if the central government stays intact and the country stays intact and there is no international uh, NATO or whatever it is on the ground that could, you know, stir up a fighting that could go on for years, mm -hmm. then we hope that that would enable us to pressure the regime a little bit or pressure some people Did in the regime, us? the Syrian people, oh. pressure the regime a little bit to change. Right. That's what we hope. Mm -hmm. The gentleman at the very back. And I'm sorry, I'm being absolutely random. Sorry. Abdul Qabi, first a comment. Brother Malik, you mentioned your preference for intervention by Jordan Army and Turkish Army. Are you aware that Jordan Army has the blood of more Palestinians on its hands than Israel has since 1948? As to the Turkish army, which again is a Sunni army, and you must be aware what 
it has been doing to its Kurdish population for years. The, the question now, you mentioned it, the elephant in the room that we do not talk about, but don't you agree with me that Syria is now on the fault line of this great Sunni Shia conflict which is building up, it started from Iraq. And as you must be aware, in Baghdad, daily bombings by, I'm a Sunni like you, by the Sunni terrorists, funded by Qataris, by Saudis, fed on the ideology what do you, what do you suggest that it that is going to happen in Syria. Right. If the international community interfered. The next, not the international community, if you do not cool down and try to resolve the differences within right. yourself, so okay. long as you keep on hankering for the America and the British to intervene, you are not learning from the past right. mistakes. Thank you very much. Can the Syrian people <coughs> cool down and wait mm. and look for a solution amongst themselves to avoid both what has been said here and what Mr. Waqaf has said in a few minutes ago? Well, I mean, obviously, it's very easy for you to say that sitting in London, to talk about, you know, cool heads and so on. But I think when you're, you know, being, uh, you know, you're being shelled. But you sit in London as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting about, I'm in daily touch with <laughs> I'm in daily touch with people on the ground who are in a very desperate situation. Um, now the whole thing about the Jordanian army and the Turkish army we can go back to history and you can no, dig up whatever. Can exactly. So what has been said so on Syria. Can we apply this? What the Syrian army has done to the Palestinians, you forget to mention that as well, like you know, Talizata and so on in Lebanon. So let's not go there because y if you open this chapter, you know, you open a can of worms. And the Syrian army is probably the worst culprit when it comes to killing Palestinians. So let's let's be you know, let's be honest about this. No, be fair. Man. no, I think that's an exaggeration yeah, I actually. Just come back after five weeks in Palestine and I know Palestine much better than yeah, but we talk, we talk yeah, about the crisis now on the Syrian land. So basically we're talking how... Let's talk, let's talk reality and not lies. You know, let's have facts, not bias, sectarian bias. Uh, I'm sorry, what you're talking about? Okay, what, what, do, what would you think of as a realistic... What would you think of as a realistic talk? Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Please, please. Only the Muslim brothers in Syria will promote sectarian killing. And the Muslim brother, and Mr. Abdi is one of them also, tried in the 80s to promote the sectarian killings, and they called their fighters as splinter groups. Today, they call them the Free Syrian Army. That's what is Muslim brothers fighting? The Salafists, the Wahhabists coming from Saudis, and Mr. Abdi knows this very well because he's one of the organizers of can sending, can please, uh, uh, please, let me tell you something, please, sending please, money to please, Lebanon please. to buy arms for those oh, killers. Please. So I will ask All the right, question get, yes, to the please. lady here. Let me ask the question. Do you know there is a tent and refugee camp being built in the south of Turkey, in the border of Syria, 15 days before any crisis started in Syria. Did you see this? Did you go ask? And I, I will correct you on Madaya. Madaya is a free, customs-free town. Right, you just know, just they all just what info. you call right. just smugglers. Just an info before we get to the comments. Right. Just an info before we get to another question and then the comments. Uh, yesterday, there has been a report from our um, uh, Beirut correspondent saying that the borders between Homs and the Lebanese uh, lands has been uh, planted with ma um, landmines by the Syrian authorities. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but could you please comment and then I'll go to... Yeah, look, uh, look we can live forever in fear of another Iraq. I think this is a very short-sighted way of looking at things. If every Arab revolution is going to end up like Iraq, we wouldn't have had the success stories like Tunisia, or Libya, or Egypt. 
Well, we, just, I mean, just a point of housekeeping. I can't, to moderate this, I need to listen to, yeah, but to moderate this, I need to listen to individuals to have individual answers. We can't well, look, do it you can, either, you can either believe in democracy or not. You know, I mean, that's what it boils down to. And if you believe in people's right to elect their own leaders or not, and if, if you believe in those things, then I surely you'll realize that the events that have happened in the last year, in the broad sense, have been positive for the Arab peoples. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come out on the streets. These people are not near, uh, moved by remote control from outside. They're moved by their own desires to live, to live a better life and to live in dignity. And if you don't recognize that, then I think you're dehumanizing the Syrian people themselves. Syrian people are not pawns in your own ideological battles between whatever, left-wing versus right-wing, neocons versus Iran. This all exists in your head. Syrian people on the ground, all they care about, they want a better quality of life. They no longer want to be run by the secret police who interfere, interfere in every aspect of their life. People want to elect their own leaders. They don't want to be told what to do. They, they don't want the country to be hostage right. to, to mullahs of in, in Iran and other places. Look, no, no, it's not sectarian. It's the fact it's of life. Sectarian. This is a fact of life in Syria. The Iranian, Iranian regime has forced, the Syrian regime has forced Iran down people's throats in Syria. Right. Can I continue? I, I, th I think that, that it's there was a question being mm -hmm. asked to you. Either you see certain things on the ground or not. What do you think that people coming from outside Syria can actually see and not see on the ground? Well, I would like to say that it may be an unpalatable truth, but uh, the sectarian issue is a big part of why this has happened and why the protests happened. No. So I can tell no. you what activists told me on the ground, right. why they were going out to protest. Because as Sunnis, in poorer parts of the country, they were fed up with corruption, they felt absolutely Alawites side. Alawites also fed up with corruption. <laughs> so, of course, there, are, there are Alawites just, who are yeah. in, in support of the opposition movement, of course. Yeah. However, the people that I met, ordinary Sunni Syrians, right, not all gun runners, <laughs> ordinary Syrians, um, college graduates, housewives, you name it, um, they were fed up of corruption, fed up of being sidelined for not being an Alawite, for not being elite, for not being a Ba'ath Party card holding member. Now, Everybody. that is an unpalatable so thing. So that's basic rights existed. of any citizen. They cannot really be applied on one sect rather than the other. No, right. actually, you can. Can I come in, You can. You can. can I come right. in, Okay. Syria has a history of 5,000 years of mixed sectarian background. It has this bloodshed never happened before. And we cannot say that there's a sectarian issue in Syria. People try to promote it. Hammer. I mean, Alawites and Sunnis For and the last 5,000 years, we haven't had a regime Hammer. like Bashar al-Assad. It's, 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 it's the regime. It's the regime. It's the regime. It's not the sectarian issue. Because in the regime, there's so many powerful people. People who hate the security are not... Some of the people who had the security are not Alawites. What's the percentage? Are, right. what well, it's not no, 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 no. Give me a percentage. Give me facts and figures we're, here. We're, we're, here to talk about, we're here to talk about how this thing can stop, not how it started. And the gentleman, I really value and I really respect your opinions and I really respect your questions. Could we please just keep it slightly cooler and calmer? I know we're talking... No, no, no. Right. It's well, part of the problem. We're talking here. We're asking it's the questions. Part of the problem. We're putting the answers one comment before I go to the next can question. I, can, I, can I just say something on the sectarian issue? I think there is some merit. There is some merit in a sectarian element of the problem in Syria. The wow, reason you being. you agree with something I say. You and I should be talking I like more. This. <laughs> but the issue is, it's not intrinsic within the Syrian society. Syria has been, since the invasion of Iraq and since the king of Jordan Abdullah II invented or described what he called the Shiite crescent Iran Iraq Syria and Hezbollah in Lebanon since that day Syria has been under a huge propaganda coming from the Saudis and this intensified after the Hariri assassination in 2005 too much and the basic message is Sunnis you are the majority why are you letting these infidels govern you and some some parts of the Syrian society have succumbed, unfortunately, to this problem. But it is this problem and this issue that has kept the country together. 
because basically the majority of Syrians, and I am again going to tell you a little bit about the majority of Syrians, the majority of Syrians do not want, if there is going to be regime change, they do not want regime change on sectarian basis. Right. They're fed up with corruption, yes. They're fed up with, uh, you know, being uh, uh, taken for a, uh, for a ride with regards to their capacity and, uh, and, and, and competencies and so on. Because if you have a competency in Syria, definitely you're not going to be appointed by anyone. And everybody is fed up of that, but they do not approve that it is because the Sunnis are a majority, they need to govern. This sort yep. of sectarian issue is not going to happen just, in Syria. Just if we can keep things related to our topic, and we're going to talk yeah. about the sectarian, the sectarian um, uh, rights of any citizen. But question from the gentleman? Um, well, I, I think my voice is loud enough, but um, for the recording, for the recording. It's a question for the, for the panel. Regardless of the geopolitical implications of what's going on... Well, I think they want you to... We do need a microphone. Thank you. Um, I just want to address a question to the panel. Um, regardless of the geopolitical scheming that's going on and everything that's happening and who started what, um, there is a desperate humanitarian crisis in the Idlib region. The Syrian regime so far has not allowed proper humanitarian aid to get into the, the wrecked areas. And nobody's addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, I mean, with Marie Colvin, with the other journalists, they're stuck there. Yes, it's a war zone, but in every war zone, humanitarian aid is always respected and allowed in. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that both opposition and regime <laughs> can and should agree on. But the question is, why is no aid being allowed into these areas? And that's a very important point. I actually agree with you. <laughs> can I? Yeah, uh, we'll answer this question, but then we're going to come back for a comment about the sectarian yeah. I actually agree with you. I think, I think the Syrian government is reluctant reluctant to bring foreign aid however they're not being offering any substitute and uh, I've called before and uh, the, the gentleman behind you if he's a member of our club he has called before for at least the Syrians in other cities you know to to send uh, uh, Come on, Ammar. It's a duty of any government to provide it medical is. aid for anybody. Well, if the government, is, well, the government is stupid. For an aid, then the let them break a domestic aid. We proposed ourselves that yeah. we will organize a humanitarian corridors as yeah, well, Syria. That's, that's they wouldn't allow us. So Why? this is it's the duty. Why, Mr. Why? I think they're being stupid about it. Basically, <laughs> you should allow, if you're not going to do it yourself, I think you should do it yourself, but at least allow a yeah, but what, civic... Why would you think that they are not guaranteeing an agreement? I mean, the ICRC, till probably two days ago, were trying to uh, negotiate with the Syrian Syria government is, is to get not into short of helms. Syria is not, neither short of food nor of medical supplies. The issue is to bring medical supplies and food to the beleaguered people. This doesn't have to come from international sources. The Syrian government can do it no themselves. But the Syrian people can do it. Why won't they do it? It's no good saying they're stupid. I don't know. I, it's, uh, it's out of my... You know, I can, I can go as far in explaining what the Syrian government thinks, but I don't know, actually, right. uh, why uh, they're not doing it. I, oh, yeah. Before we, before we move on to an another question, Malik. Well, look, we have to realize that the, the nature of democracy, you know, one man, one vote, in itself is very threatening for this regime because this regime relies on group solidarity, Alawite solidarity as its core. And anyone who denies this, I think... He doesn't know, I think, right. knows the reality. Why do you think so democracy per the say ICRC? The ICRC are talking about both sides to cease fire so they can let aid to the city, to Homs and other places. Why do you think this hasn't been uh, addressed by opposition? Well, I think the opposition have been. They, they've met with the ICRC, the Syrian National Council representative, mm -hmm. uh, two days ago. She met with delegation from the uh, Syrian National Council met with the SIRC, uh, International Red Cross, and they are trying to implement some sort of plan to get aid into Homs. Now, of course, that's conditional upon the, the regime not firing on these aid convoys, and we'll see whether the regime I think that has the basic Homs humanity to allow those. They are in Homs, and they are started to evacuate people of certain places. Yep. Just before, I need a question from this side. Anybody? Any question? Since I've no, got yes. the microphone, can I just ask a question? <laughs> International right. Committee okay. of Red Crescent, I don't know. Please. I don't know. I know the Red Crescent are there. Sorry. Um, just as Syrian, just to highlight a few points. Um, members of the oppositions are actually, and who have been oppositions for many, many years to the governments, are mostly Christians and Alawites, where, and were mostly active in the last 10, 15 years. 
the that's Sinan not actually Sun. true. Come on, it is the the, the well, communist not, party. It cannot, it cannot be true. It, it, it can't if I may true. say, factually, that's incorrect. No, no, the, the active really ones really in Syria. The active ones in Syria are, oh, you, you could say, eighty percent of them are either Alawite or uh, Christians. Right. Now Inside they Syria. are exercising their rights to oppose the government. Now. You still have Alawite who are uh, opposing the government. What you've done now is that you have actually segregated all of the Alawite and you've put them in a statement that they are all what the concrete or the pillars of the, of the government, of the regime. <laughs> This is not true. The regime is made. I never suggested that at all. Actually. The regime is made out of Basiest people. The Basiest is the ruling government party, and it's made out Bath of is all. Meaningless in Syria. Sorry. Can we just give him a chance to finish? And they are. It is. It is on. made of all factions of the Syrian society. Sunni, Alawite, Christians, Druze. All of these people belong to the Basiest party. Mm. If what you're doing in here, all I see is one side which is really an extreme side to the government. The government is, okay, yes, it is, it is corrupted. There is a requirement for reforms. There is a requirement for a, a, a sustainable change that the people require. But what I see is an anger there. An of anger. I have a right to be angry. You have the right to be angry. Do, do of course think, I have a right to be angry. Do you angry. think that acknowledging the Syrian National Council will help if, if it's acknowledged by the international community, by the Western countries and by the rest of the uh, Arab League countries, this is going to help? Sorry, acknowledgement of the... Acknowledging the, the, the Syrian, uh, Syrian National Council. I, I don't the think... Cur cur no, not really. What I see now on the ground, there is fights, there is a lot of problems in Syria, and I think that it is for the Syrian people to to sit around the table and negotiate so and end to this, cr to this yeah. crisis. Right. No military actions whatsoever. The right. victims are going to be the people on the ground. One more point, if I may say, regarding to the um, humanitarian aids, there, there has been some kind of um, uh, trials of delivering fuels and uh, at the same time delivering to, uh, food supplies to certain areas. This has been confiscated. Some uh, tankers have been blown. Now, there is people suffering, suffering from both sides, if I may so. Not just the people in Homs, uh, right. uh, 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 Anas. There is Pete Malik, sorry. Uh, there's not just the people in Homs. All of Syria is suffering. Do you think the solution is to sit down on the table and talk in negotiations inside Syria? We either go sit on the table right. with uh, regrettably, 10,000 or whatever, 7,000 people victims, or we mu will have to come back to the table right. after 100,000 people uh, being dead, and that is not what the Syrian right. wants. Syrian so wants both sides to come and sit yeah. on the table. Uh, yeah, there is a question from the very last row over there. Uh, just one question, um, just regarding the, hello, uh, the, uh, the opposition, just uh, in terms of trying to you know, stimulate like uh, the idea of sectarian problems in the. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 a little bit unacceptable in terms of trying to stimulate that at this stage because we are trying here to come up with solutions, not to uh, fuel problems. The uh, in, ter in, ter in terms of the international communities at the minute, they are not trying to solve a problem. They are trying to stand by one side at the minute, by just only one solution, is just to for the president to step down. It's based because it's been. Uh, uh, driven by the uh, Sa Saudi or the Gulf states, right. basically because they have their own agendas. The, the only solution is is to cut all the international community to bring the uh, the, uh, the opposition and to sit down with the government right. and come up with solutions to for a, for a re reform, just to guarantee reform and uh, for the elections to come and then the president so will be reform and negotiations. Elected. I've, I've I've heard that like three times. Uh, Malik is is the issue being yeah. addressed if people do not talk about how wh what originated it we're talking solutions here yeah. and the solution will require to actually lobby for some kind of either negotiations or military inter intervention or third thing look in order to get to the right solution you got to find out what the original problem is right um, and part of that original problem is a feeling by Syria's religious minorities that they have a natural right to govern the country and a natural right for them to 
be oh. in leadership position. Uh, the right. is the main, the, 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 main, the main sheikh just, in Syria. He is the, a great sheikh, Sunni sheikh. He's supporting you know, he's the regime. He's nothing. And now he is, is nothing. My, my, my question is, can if we can we look for solutions if we're not talking about the citizen? We right. cannot, we cannot talk about any solution if we're going to keep this talk about sectarian issue. We cannot, no, because no. all the sectarians in Syria are Syrians and they have the right. Yeah. That's why the solution... If the regime, if the regime used some Sorry. of them for, to continue corruption and to continue controlling the people, this is, not, uh, this is not a good reason to exclude them. The democratic transition should be inclusive. And rather than talking about these minorities, I mean, if it's, it's not fair to put it in that frame. It's the issue of a bad regime. A corrupted regime, a regime who was not respecting the people, a regime, and I tell you something, anybody of the Syrian here, please ask, who is the crisis management team in Syria who is controlling the decision made by answer. the government? Well, no, not fair to ask the this question here, because, yeah, I know. because the audience here are not really... I'm, the, talking, the I'm addressing the Syrian. Yeah, I know. But I mean, <laughs> even the Syrians here will have different, they, they, they even differ over the reason that caused all that. Some people say it's sectarian reasons. It's not purely, it's not purely. There's also a class, there's also a huge class issue in Syria as well. Uh, and it's, it's a correlation between the fact that a lot of these areas that are up in arms, right. them from working class. So it's a, there are more than one reason. That's what I'm saying. And the, but the solution comes through having democracy. And a lot of people, uh, in Syria, within the government, within the ruling elite, find the concept of democracy very challenging and very threatening, and that's why they're against it. And there are some within the opposition elite who find democracy very threatening as well, right. because they're not going to get country? elected. That's, that's, right. that's what it boils down okay. to. Can I, can I make a point here yes, on, yeah. on a solution? Please. And I think you had um, a really important question. And it's really interesting, when I was in Syria with the activists, they were absolutely against any form of intervention. They wanted to do this themselves. So this was in, what, September, October. Yeah. What's interesting is that I'm, I, before this talk, I talked to them today, yesterday, I talked to them a few times a week. Um, lots of, it's a big activist network, lots of different networks across the country. Now they have completely changed their tune. They're absolutely desperate. Um, one of them said to me, please tell everybody that we need a humanitarian corridor, we need medical aid, and we need food. Because of course, and it's not just in Homs, Idlib has been bombed, Douma has been bombed. They said no more discussions. They right. said discussions are getting us nowhere. They also said they wanted, if, if there was diplomacy, this was a message from them, they wanted all Syrian uh, embassies to be shut. They want, you know, they want something much firmer Otherwise, otherwise, the longer this takes, a the point, more discussions, the more point, people yeah. are going to be killed. The, a point of housekeeping, though, um, I know it's a rich issue and I know it has so many sides, but we are here today to talk about, yes, a solution for what's going on on the ground now in uh, the light of what's going on in Homs. So, the gentleman. I'm not an expert on uh, Syria, but... I have not. I do not have the impression that there is a big charismatic leader that is able to rise above um, all the sectarian issues. You can say there's no sectarian issues, and that may not be where this problem was born. But th in the solution, that will have to be taken into account. Um, how do you expect Syria to make the transition to democracy without this charismatic leader, such as Nelson Mandela did for South Africa? Well, sorry, Mr. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to take this into, into the wider sense. Part of the reason why people decided to stick with what they have is that they do not believe that the uh, opposition figures that are scattered everywhere and they are on TV all, all day are credible replacement or a credible substitute of what they have at this moment. This is the problem we're having. Right. A charismatic leader, I haven't seen one in the opposition, I'm, I'm sorry. If, if you mean in the opposition, do you mean in the government as well? I can't see. Well, to, to run this more positively, mm. uh, who differs with this point of view that there is no alternative? People do not trust the opposition and they think this, it's scattered so it cannot alternate. The gentleman? Okay. I, think, uh, I think you all ignoring that majority of Syrian people, in my opinion, support President Assad. And I am really surprised how you say he is a killer or, uh, or this, this word. I think, uh, I, okay, I can challenge you for this thing. I think people were killed in homes for, uh, uh, and 
uh, take photos taken and they shown on TV as they were killed by the government troops. If you, if you, I'm, I can arrange oh, for you sir, to meet you, some people here. Are you suggesting that the media reports yes, are actually yes. showing opposite of what's yes. going on on the ground? Yes, right. uh, yes. That's okay. what I think. I think the charismatic leader is President, President Assad. He's, he's doing the reform right. and he's the best person to lead people to <laughs> democracy. Right. Right. The gentleman over there, please. <laughs> By the way, we, we have five minutes. Talk about international community. Please. Okay. We've had now almost a year of this uprising. We've had all sorts of proposals that have gone to the international community here on the military front. No-fly zones, buffer zones, intervention, etc. Is it not time, first of all, to accept that the international community is not actually going to do that? Now, that's, it's not about whether this is right or wrong. If you don't start accepting that reality, then you're, not, you're, you're going to prolong uh, what is going on now yeah. because NATO isn't going to do it. Who is going to do it? Everyone is reluctant. So you have to think of an alternative strategy, if, or else we just prolong it. people will do it. Well, well uh, just gentlemen, please, I think you please. Just yeah. add your turn, so, so the so alternative. I, I, I would like yeah. to put, put another uh, issue here. Is I, I absolutely agree there is a humanitarian imperative right now in Homs Idlib and elsewhere. The ridiculous Arab League monitoring uh, presence was clearly a failure. What really is needed is an end to the fighting right now. If you, you can't supply humanitarian aid in the middle of fighting right. anyhow. So, so it's serious monitoring mission, much larger, independent, credible leadership. Right. So realistic point of view, what's the alternative? If the international community is not going to interfere in a way, or the Syrian people are actually refusing the international community yeah. to interfere in a military way? Well, I think the, one of the alternatives was suggested by the Saudi foreign minister today which is to arm the Free Syrian Army, which I think is a very good idea. This will give the Syrian people an opportunity to fight back and to win their freedom in the same way as the Americans, when if they won their freedom from the British 300 years ago. That didn't make their revolution any less valid, the fact that they got arms from the French. Uh, can I just come in on, on the issue of the opposition? I agree with you, there's a failure of leadership on the, op on the opposition. But there are a number of leaders who have been kind of sidelined, but who are perhaps um, starting to emerge. One of them is someone who I hugely admire. I, I <laughs> slightly differ with politically, but I admire his leadership potential, who's George Sabra, who's actually a Christian, right. ex-communist, fantastic guy, and I think he's going to uh, step forward but perhaps in the next few years. So, 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 so you see alternatives, Dr. Amuna? Yeah. Yes, I think the alternative... I think we should think out of the box. I mean, the Syrians are not these figures in the opposition or the people in the regime. We have so many good people, charismatic men, who have just need to be and involved. Women. Uh, and women. I mean, and women. Men, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in inclusive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should. They should be part of the political process in the in the city, and then you can have all this leadership appear. Now there are so many people who has who has not been uh, clearly on on uh, shown themselves, like the the, the the opposition, the leader of the opposition. I think the leader of the opposition are the heroes who are on the on the on the ground, not the people who are uh, not people who just you know, uh, yeah. talk about this issue. Go These the are the people yeah. who are heroes. These yeah, are right. the people who are sacrificed, but they need the chance to formulate their leadership and to appear. And this is could be done if, if the Syrians were lucky and they have a common say for negotiation process and political process, then we will see many leaders right. who can be an alternative for anybody. Yes. Okay, one last quick, quick question. Quick mm -hmm. question, the lady. Right. This is this is going to be very quick, a very quick question and a very quick answer. The lady, please. Um, <clears throat> you're all accepting, you know, the failure of the international community so far to do anything, and I I wish this could have been discussed a little more. Is this an, like a Spanish Civil War scenario, but with with the communications, as right. Marie Colvin said, look at Srebrenica. We're all aware. I would like to ask all of you about the Arab League and why there isn't more embarrassment about the failure of their observer mission, which was just alluded to. We hear so much about Arab pride, and I'm just surprised that they can sit back and let this happen of all the regional uh, powers. Right, I'll have two very quick answers from Mr. Wakhaf, please. I don't think, basically, the actually the most successful thing the Arab League has done is the monitors. 
basically. Because that was the first time when an independent body from outside Syria could go in and see what was happening. Now, the people who are controlling the Arab League at the moment, basically the Gulf states, have a, settle, have a score to settle with the Syrian government. They are not going to accept anything apart from the overthrow of the current right. government. Malik, briefly. So what was the question? The question was about the Arab League. <laughs> ah. That's an answer? No, look, I mean, uh, uh, there, are, there are countries within the Arab League that are uh, <laughs> taking positive steps, and in particular the Gulf countries within the Gulf Cooperation Council. They're leading the way in this. There are other countries like Algeria, which are sort of one of the last man standing, um, so that, that obviously that the, the Algerians are going to pull that, you know, they're not going to move very quickly, but the Gulf countries are moving. And I think those are the countries that are supporting democratic right. transitions in many countries, not just in Syria. I, 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 I am aware, I am aware that, that I am aware that, that there were tens of other <laughs> questions and suggestions and comments, but this is, we actually overstayed our welcome. I'd really like to thank everybody here and thank my guests as well, Dr. Muna and uh, Mr. Ammar and Ramita and Malik. Thank you very much and thanks to all of you. Thank you.